services, AngularJS with Browserify. He already gave me a little introduction. I've got my slides posted up uh, at that bit.ly link. We're just going to dive right in because I'm already done to 14 minutes. So we're going to cover very quickly what Browserify is, what it does, why using it is a good thing, and how your Angular code can benefit from it. So what the heck is it? So quickly, how many people have at least heard of Browserify, have some sort of idea what it is? OK, aces. So Browserify, in a, a bullet point, is require modules for the browser. So it's an alternative to something like AMD and require.js. So Browserify allows you to use the common JS module format, which is an alternative format to AMD that, that you would use with require.js. The thing about it is, common JS is synchronous. And so they use it in Node because synchronous is OK in Node. Usually synchronous you know, dependency loading in the browser is not OK. That's where Browserify comes in. So in case you're not familiar with common JS syntax, we've got two common JS modules here. The top one, event.js, just exports a string as its value. You know, that's what it provides to the rest of the world. Welcome.js imports uh, event. And then, I've all, so the fact that it starts with the dot means that it's like a relative file path include. The underscore is just a named, you know, external. So welcome.js then exports welcome to ng-conf by using the value that it got from event.js. You can also export multiple values from a module if you need to by using the exports uh, object directly. So in a bulleted list, overly simplified what Browserify does, you give it an entry file and say, start here and read all of my require files, and, or my require statements, and walk those, those calls to build up my dependency graph. So your entry file maybe requires two other files, those two require three more, and on and on and on. Bundles it all into a single file, but it doesn't just you know, concatenate it into one big blob, it actually wraps the contents of each file that it finds in a closure. And that's essentially how it makes the synchronous loading work. And so it, it of course, supports source maps so that you don't have to debug you know, the giant output. You debug your single files. So the closure that I mentioned looks like this. And so our initial module, our events module, would end up looking like this after Browserify parses it. And those function arguments should look familiar, right? It's the require method that you use to load other dependencies, and then the module and exports objects that you use for exposing your values. So instead of those being provided by the node environment, where they are usually, they're provided by Browserify for you. A couple of terminology things. We already kind of talked about entry files, uh, bundles. You generally refer to the output of, of Browserify as a bundle. The bundle file is what it produces for you. There are transforms, which are uh, just what they sound like, source transforms that happen before the bundling or as part of the bundling. And we're going to get into those a little bit. And then aliases to let you, you know, if you have like a deeply nested file somewhere that you use in a lot of places, if you want to avoid making that file path every time, you can give it an alias name and just refer to it by name. So that's the very high level three and a half or so minute introduction to what it is. Why would you want to use it? To me, the baseline, you know, baseline advantage you get is that the, the common JS syntax to me is just drop dead simple, right? You're writing JavaScript. You have enough like objects and functions and returns to worry about in your own code. Why make, you know, why make it so you have to wrap everything in another one? for something like require.js <clears throat> when you can just use, you know, very straightforward, give me this, export this kind of syntax. The other one is that it, you know, it sort of exposes you or, or welcomes you into the Node and NPM ecosystem, which are huge. I mean, obviously there's a ton of Node com uh, code and, and modules out there. There's about 55,000 modules on NPM right now. 
growing like crazy. And uh, a lot of those modules will actually run just fine in the client without changes. And using Browserify, you just require them in and you're done. NPM install, how many people have done at least <clears throat> a little bit of node work? Okay, so pretty many of you. So using NPM install to you know, download and install all of your project dependencies is a really nice workflow. If you haven't used Node, but you've used uh, like RubyGems or Maven, NPM is similar, except it works. <laughs> so these are a good number of Node core modules. Browserify, I think this is actually a pretty large majority of the Node core API. Browserify actually provides you browser-friendly shims of all of these Node modules. So you have the Node event system and the path parsing and the URL parsing and all kinds of other stuff, and you can just use it. Consistency is a big one for me. Um, so when you work in Browserify, you're always building. You know, you set up some sort of watch, and every time you f save a file, Browserify bundles your stuff. It's not like a, a productivity drain. We have a pretty large app um, with about 20 or, <clears throat> 20 or so modules, I think. Our builds during the watch are about a half a second, which is about as long as it takes me to flip over to the browser. Um, so you're, you're minimizing your, your environment dependencies, right? The same exact code that I'm running on my machine while I'm developing is the same exact code that runs on the dev server. And the only difference between the dev server and production is that production gets you know, minified and compressed. The fact that some people, like I don't know if you guys saw the, the five word tech horrors uh, Twitter trend a little while ago, but my favorite one was we only bundle in production because it's crazy to me that you would test and develop code in one way and then deploy a totally different bit of uh, bundle of code to production. Okay, so transforms are where things start to get a little more interesting. Transforms, like I said, they transform your code before your code gets inserted into that bundle. There are, I mean, there's tons of transforms out there. These are just a, a couple of interesting ones. DAMDFI and DBowerify are just what they sound like. They let you use modules written for those systems directly in your Browserify code without touching anything. Uh, HBSify, which you'll notice there's a lot of sort of like awkward words when you work with Browserify because everybody adds if I. Um, I think they missed an I in theirs, but so that is a transform that will pre-compile handlebars templates for you. So you just require your template file and as part of the bundle, it'll pre-compile it for you. Coffeeify, compiles your coffee script. ES6ify, uh, we've heard various mentions of ES6 uh, at the conference. ES6ify is a transform that lets you write an ES6 module, transpiles it for you during bundling. And then there's just, there's tons more. So this is the entirety of the code for the HBSify uh, transform module. So it just exports a single function. That function accepts a file. So that's the signature for any transform you write. Browserify is just going to send you a file. This one checks the file name to see is this a handlebars file. If it's not, it just says, all right, I got nothing to do. Exits. If it is, reads the file into memory, precompiles it, and replaces the code with the precompiled template. Very, very handy. Very, very easy. So. All right, we're doing all right on time, surprised. Um, so this is an Angular conference, so how does this relate to Angular? I, I feel like Browserify is a very beneficial way to write client-side code regardless of what framework you're using or if you're not using one or, or whatever the case may be. <coughs> Excuse me. So, but let's take a look at it. So before we get into there, uh, package.json is how you sort of uh, document and manage your dependencies for a node project or a browserify project. <clears throat> You've got your 
app name or your module name, your version number, some scripts. This one is actually really nice. I mentioned the NPM install workflow. So whenever a developer checks out the code for our project and runs NPM install, after it downloads everything, it will run that grunt task that will install a, uh, a git pre-commit hook that will run all of our linting and our unit tests before they're allowed to commit. It'll actually prevent commits. Um, then just some regular dependencies like Mocha, Grunt, Grunt Browser 5, D3. These last two, though, are actual modules that we wrote for our application, but that we know will be useful outside of our application. We can't publish them to NPM because, you know, they're internal code, but we broke them out, set them up in their own repository, and then we can install them like any other module including specifying the version number. So it's a really, really easy way to break your app into smaller pieces, right? You build big things out of a bunch of smaller things. And then the bottom piece there is just uh, an alias config like we talked about before. Finally, some required JS, or some uh, required JS, some Angular code. So in this case, this is our, this is an abbreviated version of the app file for my application at work. We require Angular itself. We require login, charts, and routes. And you can tell that they're local files by the fact that they start with a dot. We define our app module. We list login, charts, yada, yada, as the dependencies. And we're just pulling the name off of those exports because we're exporting the module itself. You can just grab the name there. Routes. Same thing, we configure our route provider in the routes.js file. And then the last one is, since we're using package.json to manage everything and, and version everything, we can actually pull the version right out of that JSON file and insert it as a constant in our Angular file to expose, you know, in like a context menu or whatever. This is the same file, but even more concise, if you like to Save space, so rather than creating variables for everything I require, I'm just sticking the requires directly in that list and pulling the name right off of there. Since the require statement is synchronous and it actually returns the thing you need, you can just use it directly. So we've got the one, the second require there, require dot slash modules slash charts. So that tells you it's a local, you know, like a file path, but charts is actually not a file, it's a directory. And if you require a directory, it will look for index.js. And so this is our app.charts module. And our app.charts module is made up of more smaller pieces. It's made up of our pie chart module, our timeline module, tree map, scatter plot, and then we have a, a controller defined <clears throat> to sort of manage everything. Now if we go one layer deeper into the pie directory, Again, it's a directory. We've got our index.js file here. We've got a directive and a controller. Our module is now app.charts.pychart, and everything's pulled in like that. The important takeaway from this, though, is that you're not mixing your module configuration from your module contents anymore, right? The only thing that this file does is set up our PyChart module. It pulls in the pieces. You don't have like, this is the name of my module, this is a giant directive that's part of this module, this is a giant controller, everything is separated. And this actually, we haven't quite gotten there yet, but I plan to sort of break out these individual charts into their own repositories like the other stuff, and then that way if we need to build a new app that has, you know, needs a new version of the pie chart, we can just iterate there and everybody has their own dependencies. Finally, we have an actual directive, a very simple directive, but we've just got module.exports, here's the function, and we return our, you know, our, our directive object. And, I mean, obviously, everybody here knows that this is a directive function, right? It's a, it's a structure that, that we all recognize. But technically, there's no Angular code in here, right? So you, could, you can write a module that is pure JavaScript, you know, just a piece of logic that is unique to your business or your project or whatever the case may be. And then, you know, maybe you need to package it for 
a legacy backbone app that you have, and then you package it in another module for your Angular app, and you've got everything nicely separated, independently versioned, super easy to manage. And that's it.